wanted to ask you, who here uses Waze as their preferred GPS app? See uh, a lot of practically everyone. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Waze. Unbeknownst to you, the Waze started as a community nonprofit organization uh, in 2006, and it was created with one goal in mind, to crowdsource data and create a free map of Israel. That was in 2006. In 2008, the project was commercialized. In 2011, the company had 80, 80 employees. In 2012, the app was downloaded 20 million times worldwide. And in 2013, the company was sold to Google for $966 million. And the rest is history. Now, Waze is really a household name and is the most commonly used GPS app around the world. So what Way does, it crowdsources the real traffic data from its users, mostly using their departure and arrival times, to calculate the quickest route to get you to a destination. All with one purpose in mind, to save us time and aggravation of being stuck in traffic. Now, in medicine, we do something very similar. We crowdsource the knowledge that was acquired by our colleagues in order to take care of our patients. And today, I want to crowdsource the knowledge that I've acquired from my practice to tell you about the presenting signs of an uncommon but important condition, optic nerve sheath meningioma. Now, in order for ways to produce the route for you, it needs to know your departure and arrival points, and then it can calculate the quickest route to your destination. So when we work in clinic, our departure points is our day sheet with a list of patients that we've got to take care of, and the preferred arrival point for most of us is the day that's finished on time with the knowledge that we've provided the best possible care to our patients. So, <clears throat> just as way, Waze needs this information of your departure and arrival points, we use our departure and arrival points and in order to look at, we look at our day sheets and we calculate an algorithm of how to arrive to our day on time. Now, there are always obstacles <coughs> along our way, just as in driving. There are difficult personalities, there are rare and unexpected clinical findings, and today I'll share with you an algorithm that I've developed on how to deal with three fairly uncommon clinical findings. Let me tell you about them. The first clinical finding is patient presenting with a chronically swollen optic nerve. Now, we know that any demyelinating or otherwise inflammatory or ischemic insult to the intraorbital or intracanalicular optic nerve will produce most of the time one result, and that is the swelling of the optic nerve head. The swelling will persist for approximately four to six weeks, and then it will be invariably replaced by various degree of optic nerve pallor. Now, it's when this swelling persists for over six weeks that we call it chronic optic nerve head swelling. So that's the first finding, patient with a chronically swollen optic nerve. The second is a patient with a, what we call an optociliary shunt, which is really a collateral vessel connecting retinal and choroidal circulation. And the third sign is the patient with a varying degree of optic nerve pallor, for which you do not have a good explanation for. And the good explanation here would be a previous history of demyelinating optic neuritis in this eye, or a good story for a previous history of non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, such as this patient waking up sometime prior to this event with an altitudinal visual defect, which has remained unchanged. And now, as you can see, they have a crowded disc at risk in the fellow eye. So the three findings that are characteristic of patients with optic nerve sheath meningiomas are chronically swollen optic nerve, 
optocellular shunt and varying degree of optic nerve pallor. Now, optic nerve sheath meningiomas are meningiomas. And meningiomas are tumors arising from the meninges, the covering of the brain. And uh, we know that presumably the part of the meninges that gives rise to meningiomas are the arachnoid villi. And in the case of optic nerve sheath meningioma, the meningioma arises from the arachnoid villi of the covering of the optic nerve. And invariably, as the tumor, here in red, grows, it will continue to produce increasing amount of visual dysfunction, which often terminates in visual loss. Although, in the beginning, many of these patients can present with normal or almost normal visual function. And oftentimes, these patients are picked up on routine optometric exam when a chronic optic nerve swelling is detected. So, whenever you see a patient who has a chronically swollen optic nerve, patient with an optociliary shunt, or a varying degree of optic nerve pallor, for which you do not have a good explanation, the algorithm, your detour, is always the same. You've got to do the following. You've got to order a neuroimaging study, and it's got to be an MRI. CT is not good at picking up optic nerve sheath meningioma. So you've got to order an MRI. Now the MRI has to be of the right area, not of the brain. You've got to ask for the MRI of the orbit. Because if you ask for the MRI of the brain only, the chances are that you're not going to get high quality thin slices through the orbit. So it's got to be the MRI. The MRI has got to be of the orbit. And you've got to ask for contrast. Contrast really dramatically increased the rate of detection of optic nerve sheath meningiomas. So it has to be an MRI, it has to be of the right area of the orbit, and the contrast has to be given. Here's an example of my patient with an optic nerve sheath meningioma, and this is a T1 weighted image. And if you look here carefully, you'll notice that the optic nerve on this side is a little bit thickened, but you've got to really look to notice that. However, as soon as this patient has administered contrast, the optic nerve sheath meningioma becomes very, very obvious. So the algorithm that I propose you use whenever you encounter a patient with a chronically swollen optic nerve, patient with a presence of optociliary shunt, or presence of varying degree of optic nerve pallor, for which you do not have a good explanation for, is that you always do the following. Ask for an MRI of the orbit with contrast. And that will help you arrive to your desired destination on time and save you time and aggravation of being stuck in a huge traffic jam, which can sometimes last for a long time. Once you've arrived at your destination and you've diagnosed a patient with an optic nerve sheath meningioma, we do not have an, a uniform treatment guidelines, but most of us, elect to observe patients who have good or stable visual function. However, as soon as the visual decline has been documented, we always refer them for treatment. And there is really only one treatment modality for these patients, which is stereotactic fractionated radiotherapy. Uh, and the fractionated simply means that instead of delivering radiation in one shot, it is fractionated into many sessions. So remember, patients with a chronically swollen optic nerve, patients with optociliary shunt, and patients with varying degree of optic nerve pallor, for which you do not have a good explanation, all require the same algorithm. They require an MRI over the orbit with gadolinium in order to help you arrive to your destination on time. Thank you.